I'm like very, very excited to be here today. And, and just being in this room with all of you, with all these great ideas, these great stories to tell, and truly in this idea of TED and ideas worth spreading, I just get so excited when I come here. And traditionally, when I get excited, I usually end up like this, right? Just all clenched up, which according to Debbie's talk, I'll probably be dead in a few years, because this is like the most unhealthy thing that you could do. But uh, this, this is my fist, but this is my science fist. So fist, science fist. Fist, science fist. Got it, good. Uh, if you could bring it back all the way to the first slide, who's ever back there, it's like the Wizard of Oz, but back to the beginning slide, please. So in order for us to really understand what this science fist is, and before I lose all credibility with the audience for just being crazy, I really believe that people and our ideas are a result of the people and events that we encounter within our life, both positive and negative. In education, they call this the constructivist theory of education. We make meaning of what we encounter through the events and the people that we encounter. So for me, I like to go back to the beginning and I've worked very hard to develop this idea to how do we bring this idea of mapping our momentum. I've worked with very high level strategists both here at IIT, universities across Chicago, private sector people to develop a means to really show you how to build momentum. So today, for the first time ever, I am very, very excited to prevail to you the bar graph. <laughs> the simple bar graph, yes. It's so simple, but it's so powerful. Throughout our lives, we're always gaining momentum. Now, we always start at the beginning, which starts with birth. So I was very fortunate to be born into a very loving, supportive, caring family. My mother and father, probably the most hardworking people you'll ever meet. They're probably working right now and tomorrow and the rest of the week, what have you. <laughs> More so than the love and the support, they taught me the ability and, and the importance of helping other people. Whatever you do in life, be of value to somebody else. For example, my two older brothers. If one of them would lock me in the dog cage, the other one would say, hey, at least give him a pillow while he's in there, right? <laughs> so thoughtful, I so much appreciate that. So second to your family, the other experience that you have as a child is schooling. You spend six hours a day there. This is where we go through experiential learning, constructing who we are within the context of our world. Am I the academic? Am I an athlete? Or I'm just the hyperactive kid that can't sit still? Or am I the wise ass cracking jokes in the back? Who are you? So in order to look at this in my educational history, I like to look at my third grade report card. Now I'm an educator and I see that, I'm like, that's essentially like translation, we wasted a year of instruction, good luck for the rest of your life, have a great summer. <laughs> Who says that? Like apparently my third grade teacher says that. So, and I think she was actually really nice. But things got better in fourth grade, don't worry. In fourth grade, things continued. <laughs> I'm in fourth grade. Fourth grade, you know, like what is happening that is so detrimental to my learning that this is going on? And essentially what it comes down to is I was not engaged. I was not a sit in the seat, do as you are told, raise your hand when you have a question, don't you dare blurt out and answer these worksheets. It just wasn't beneficial. I really found myself at a young age being stressed out. Like this idea of grades, it just didn't matter to me. I actually recall having a conversation with my parents where I was getting D's. I was in like third or fourth grade, I got a D. And I remember saying to my parents, well, that's why they have D's. Somebody has to get them. <laughs> good. There's value there. There is ex ex exceptional value there, right? We need to make ownership of who we are as people to understand where we fit in in the world. In fifth grade, we actually moved. We moved to a new town, and it couldn't have come at like a better time. New school, blank slate, new group of friends. Hard to make friends, but new group of friends, new neighborhood, everything was good. I had a blank slate. Here's fifth grade. Yeah. It happens. Now this is starting to go through this experiential learning. Like at this point, I don't like school. I love going to school. I love being around people. I like helping people. People drop stuff. I'm the first one, even as a teacher now, I'm the first one to get down there and help them pick up their pens and pencils. I love being around people. I love talking to people and helping people, but I don't like school. One of the things that I like, like art, I loved art, no problem, hands down, good artist. The other things I just had a hard time with. So around this time now, I moved to high school, and I started realizing that I needed some part-time work, and I realized that I wasn't going to sit behind a desk, and I wasn't going to find door-to-door -door sales. I needed to be out. I needed to be doing something. I started working with children at this time. I found much value in this. The best part about working with children is that you're going to be the biggest kid on the bus. 
Nobody is stealing my lunch when I am on the bus with these kids. It, it felt good to help these kids. As I was a camp counselor and I would take these group of kids, we'd go on field trips, we'd go places, and it was just like me and like my kids and we would experience the world through our own way. And everybody brought value to it. It was just such an exciting experiment. And then at one point, I remember in college, my father uh, kind of took me aside and uh, we had the talk. This is not the birds and the bees talk. Because I'm in college, I know about that stuff. But he kind of was like, where do you fit in? What do you want your profession to be? What are you going to do with your life? And, I, and I, I value my father so much. He's such an, an amazing person. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be told what to do because of my experience in school. So I knew in some capacity I wanted to lead in some way. I just didn't know what. It could be business. I don't know anything about business. My dad was the one that kind of strung it all together. He said, you love helping people. You are high energy. You love working with kids. Be a teacher. It's a very significant milestone in my life and in this story of mapping my momentum. In truth, my dad actually said, be a teacher. You get summers off and you're in a building filled with young, beautiful women. So I was like, thanks, Dad. I could do that. So at that point, I decided to become a teacher. And one of the greatest things about becoming a teacher is you get to do whatever you want in your school photo. So every year I do something different, yes. I didn't dress up this year, by the way. No, right? So there you are. You become a teacher. Now, at this time, I'm graduating college. My wife and I move back to Chicago. We start a family, another huge milestone. For those of you that have families, they give you just so much value. Now, you, I remember being a first year teacher, telling the parents of my students, I will treat your children as if they are my own. And I believed what I said. But until I had my own children, I had no idea what I meant. <laughs> It's such a significant relationship between a teacher and a student. Now, my view on education, as you're seeing through the map being built, is that I wanted to ensure that the kids that were like me, the kids that might not want to be there for whatever reason, found value in being in a classroom. We could take our learning outside of the classroom. We could work in groups. We could work with one another. But we had to find value together. So that was my mission. I moved back to Chicago again with my family, started teaching. Uh, I got a Drive Teaching Award, Delivering Results Through Innovative Visionary Educational Practices. It's a long acronym, and I'm even surprised I uh, remembered it. But it was cool. And then in 2005, a very significant event happened. I had my best friend, uh, a friend of mine from high school. We were college roommates. He, uh, he was a United States Marine. And uh, he flew in for my wedding, surprised everybody. It was amazing that he was there. He had done two tours in Iraq. Uh, during his first tour, he had some, some difficulties. He injured his back uh, during the first Battle of Fallujah, was flown back home for surgery. The doctor said it would take about nine months to recover. He was in Iraq in three. He earned three Purple Hearts in his tour of duty for being injured in the line of duty. He had already had a degree in social work from Illinois State University. A lot of fellow, his fellow Marines looked up to him. I learned a lot from him. When you have to write somebody letters that is thousands of miles away, when you have to plug your cell phone in at night just so that you might get three seconds on the phone with them, that's a very powerful thing. He was killed in 2005 by a roadside bomb by an IED in the Al-Ambar province of Iraq. This is so significant because, as I stated earlier, we construct our meaning and our place in the world through both the positive and the negative experiences. This is both positive and negative. The loss of a loved one is detrimental. But I'm the kind of guy that I always look for that silver lining. And if I saw that I was driven to be a great educator, I was driven to make a difference in these kids' lives, if this guy can sleep in a foxhole in the middle of the desert, thousands of miles away from people that he loved, defending people that he didn't know, but he believed in defending their freedom, that kicked me into second, third, fourth, and even fifth gear. I just went nuts. So I started teaching with a whole new purpose. At this point, I started seeking out new opportunities to be a better educator. I got a fellowship with Project Exploration. They brought me out to the Badlands of Montana. This is the birth of the Science Fist. This is the first known photo ever taken of the Science Fist. And what was really cool about this is that I was out in the middle of nowhere working on this paleontology dig with a famous scientist from University of Chicago. And I'm out there, and I'm just so excited. It's like 5 in the morning. We're drinking like Sanka coffee in this little hotel in Weibo, Montana. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yes. And finally, this guy, like day two, he's like, what's with you, man? <laughs> he's like, what's your deal? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like hey, what's this? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm just so excited. It's, it's like a... It's like a science fist. And I was like, oh, you know, it caught on. That fall, I came back to school. I started just preaching the science fist gospel. These kids that I worked in the neighborhood in the struggling community on the northwest side, they would come to science, and they're engaged. They're excited. They're doing hands-on inquiry-based learning. And they'd be, I got it, science fist, our science fair. <laughs> we turned our science fair into like a 400-person formal event at night. We would bring 400 people in from the community, many of whom don't even speak English, but they would all be like, science fist. 
we knew we had something, and we knew that it was something worth capitalizing on for the benefit of the children. It was then that we started the Science Fist Foundation. And the Science Fist Foundation is dedicated to bringing at-risk students into the world of science through hands-on, after-school, STEM mentoring programs. We do it in a really innovative way, three-tiered approach. First, we partner. I'm a full-time teacher, and I run a nonprofit. I don't have time to write tons of curriculum. So where was our value? Our value, again, was helping other people. So we developed this network, a professional network, the Museum of Science and Industry, the Illinois Institute of Technology, Shedd Aquarium, Chicago Ideas Week, all these amazing organizations, and we help them get in touch with the teachers. So we find teachers, we pair them up with a program that's already existing, and they get this after-school curriculum, they go back to their school and put on an after-school club. The second part is we enhance that opportunity by bringing in mentors. We have a phenomenal woman named Kate who works at Science Fist. She's the only other person that works at Science Fist besides me. And she is amazing. She goes to the schools. She's interacting with the kids. We're really helping build this experience for kids. We bring in STEM mentors. We try for scientists, engineers, doctors, people in the STEM fields to help bring value to these kids. And the third thing we do is we connect everybody. We have an online blog where all the Science Fist students all over the city and all these different neighborhoods are learning to blog and find vo value and power and voice in their blog and their after school learning opportunities. It's really cool. So I came to IIT. I figured I needed more credibility. I can't just be the crazy bald guy with lots of energy trying to do something about science fist. I came here to pursue a master's degree in science education. After that point, I continued networking, developed lots of partnerships with all these organizations plus Tons, tons more. Some we just talk to and we figure out ways to strategize with one another. Other people, we actually instill their programs into other schools. People are finding value. And again, that common thread running from the time I was a kid all the way to teaching and now post this, this era right now, it's all about helping other people find value. If Science Fist is successful, our partners and our students are successful. That's cool. Last year, I was awarded the Golden Apple Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching. Um, and who was there to surprise me on that day? My mom and dad, my wife, my kids, the family that had stuck through me and stuck with me, showed me all this perseverance. Help other people. Be a good person. Don't give up. It was really exciting to see them there that day. From this point now, here's data. This is our data. We don't have dropout rates or success rates. We have smiles and science fists. The saddest thing is I have, not met yet, I have not yet met some of these students, but they're excited about STEM education. These are middle school students from struggling communities across Chicago. When people say, what do you guys do? That's what we do. That's power. That's excitement. That's innovation in education, and we love it. Just this winter, we hosted an event called the Chicago STEM Social. Its mission was to connect, create, and innovate the future of STEM education in Chicago. We brought together 75 STEM education leaders from Chicago to talk about what can we do to work together to provide equitable opportunities for all students in Chicago. It was a really exciting event. We're actually hosting the spring STEM Social right here at IIT on June 1st. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, it's cool. And then we're here today, TEDx IIT. Like, who, who wouldn't want to come to a TEDx event? That's momentum. That's good momentum, right? <laughs> to close, so here's the idea. This is my momentum map, but everybody's got this. Everybody lives a life. Everybody has known, known the positive experiences, the people you've met in your life, both positive and negative, that experience and make who you are. When you ask people, like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a structural engineer. Oh, you know, I'm a teacher. Well, that might be the things you do. Let us, let not, we should not let that define us. We, have all, we all have great ideas, some not so great, but we all have ideas. The idea here is that everybody can go back in their life and they can find out who influenced me both positively and negatively. My contention here today, my idea we're spreading in the theme of TED is that if you have an idea, you need to take that idea and get it off paper. Take your words off of a strategic plan. Get it out of a business model. Build it, you know, take it out of the cloud computing. You need to take those words and you need to live those words. You need to breathe life into your ideas. Because without that, you are not going to gain momentum for your ideas. You need to take those words, you need to take your five bars in your bar graph, if you will, you need to clench them in your fist and you need to live those words. When you got this power, when you see me up here talking like this about this ridiculous thing called Science Fist, you know it's real. We're not a landing page on the web. We're not a strategic plan or a business model. We live this work. And when I do this, and when you feel this, and you see me acting like this, and you feel it too, and you can do this, that's how you gain momentum. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>